Well, welcome everybody. This, this panel today, right now, is called Can Local and Organic Feed the World? And at our last panel, we had a very lively discussion about the evils of Big Egg, about Walmart now embracing organic food. Is organic food from Walmart really going to save the world? Is Walmart going to continue its corporate uh, strategy of getting organic people into the fold and then sort of suppressing the price of that so they can sell it more cheaply? So it's a very, very interesting discussion. In fact, the last panel, nobody wanted it to stop. So in a way, this is kind of a continuation of the thoughts we were all having. There's so many complex issues being brought up around the food, around the, around the ideas and the concepts of how do we feed locally, how do we create local food systems, and how do we meet supply, how do we meet the demand um, for increased organic consumption. So today I'm going to introduce the panel, which is going to be moderated by Debbie Barker, who is with the Center for Food Safety. We'll start at this end of the panel of the table with Molly Jean, who is a farmer from Oxnard. She's been farming with her family for, she's the second generation, the third and the fourth generations are already well on their way. Um, next to her is Will Daniels from Earthbound Farm. Um, next to him is Farmer Phil McGrath, who is from Camarillo, and if you drive down the 101 freeway, you will go right past his farm. Um, after that, we have Bruce Palma, who is the president, uh, chairman, general manager. sorry? General manager. General manager of Co-Opportunity Natural yes. Foods, wonderful <laughs> natural co-op, right here in Santa Monica, and they bravely, they kept organic pastures milk on the shelf when uh, Whole Foods, dropped it, Used to, we can still get organic pastures, raw milk, at Co-Opportunity, which is a wonderful thing. And our moderator is Debbie Barker, who is with the Center for Food Safety. Um, after this panel is over, we actually have a little bit of leeway. Our next panel is not till 4 o'clock. But the 4 o'clock panel is 21st Century Meat and Dairy. And that's going uh, to have Cindy Daly from Organic Valley, Chris Ely from Applegate Farm, Mark McAfee from Organic Pastures, Bill Nyman from BN Ranch, and Mel Coleman from Nyman Ranch. Uh, it'll be moderated by Andrew Gunther, who is with Animal Welfare Approved. So the dialogue will continue, and we hope you plan to stick around and learn even more. So with no further ado, Debbie Baker, I'm going to turn the panel over to you. Okay. We Thank will you. have a Q&A afterward um, when you decide you want to stop, and we can go with, with Q&A. Thank you so much for thank being you. here. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thank you to the organizers. Um, it's really, I think you all would agree, a really terrific um, opportunity to share things and learn from one another, not only here, but out with the booths and things like that. So thanks to the organizers a lot. Um, since there were brief introductions done, I think what I'll do is um, ask maybe a minute or two and ask each of you to talk about what it is a little bit in more detail that you do. But before we do that, I thought I would um, set a bit of a frame for the issue of food security and hunger. Um, as we know, hunger is actually increasing, and today in the world we have at least over one billion people who go hungry. And we have millions more who are called uh, under the category of food insecure. And it's a daunting problem, and it's one of the major crises of our time, is how do we feed an increasing, uh, increasingly hungry planet? And what is it that, um, you know, we've had all of this, these supposed miracle seeds with green revolutions, industrial agriculture, and now with genetically modified seeds that we're supposed to be feeding the planet. So on this uh, panel, we might explore a little bit on uh, what's gone wrong, and these folks demonstrate what is going right and in the direction that we need to go if we're going to address food insecurity on a global level, but also in the US. Um, in the US right now, we've had a dramatic increase in hunger in the last three years. Um, in 2008, there was a huge spike, about 50 million people added to what we'd call hungry people every day. That's uh, 17 million households, 14.6% of our population. Uh, people are going hungry every day. That's one in seven people. So it's not just a global, what's global is also very local. 
And it's important when we look for solutions to look for those links and make the links between the local, the global, regional, and um, <clears throat> really look at it in a holistic manner. So we'll try and encompass some of that in the discussion. Um, I think, so the big question is, can local organic feed the world? And as we were talking back stage, you know, most of the farmers are saying, well, wow, I didn't realize it was my mandate, really, to feed the world, right? <laughs> I'm just trying to keep my farm going. And, um, and in it, but the way I think that, that it's so great, this panel, that we actually have the local people doing this, because if we didn't have local producers and the farmers who are figuring out how we extract ourselves from an industrial system that has failed to feed the planet, and us here at home, without you all doing this work, it wouldn't, we wouldn't even be, be at all, no one would be food secure. And you are pointing the way toward the future, absolutely. And so I just think this is really key that we have it, this discussion even on this local basis. Because um, really what you see in this panel is, I think the work that everyone's doing is challenging the industrial paradigm that has failed to feed the world, and that has also left environmental destruction and a history, <clears throat> a legacy of, you know, poisoning our soils, our air, our water. We can get into that a little bit more. And this panel is representing and challenging the alternatives to that. Um, as far as that bigger question, though, in my work, <clears throat> a lot of, I'm going to a lot of international uh, conferences and things, and the big question is, yeah, organic's great, it's fine, we support it, you know, a lot of big industrial agribusiness will say that, but we can't feed the world with it. But in the last year, we've had really great, exciting studies come out that really refute that notion that organic is um, small, lower yields than industrial. In fact, these studies show there's a new report from, if you're interested, the United Nations just put this out, the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. It's a comprehensive study of about 290 countries, involved 9 million farmers from all over the world, and the farmers who were using agroecological -eco methods or organic methods actually increased their yields in rain-fed areas 50 to 100 percent, and in irrigated areas um, it, it was smaller in 10 percent. Point being, that this study and many others like it, there's um, also even the World Bank has been coming out with studies in the Food and Agriculture Organization. These have been 10 and 20 year studies going on and the re results are really um, astonishing even to people who supported organic to show that we actually can have not only an ecological system that sustains the soil so we can keep that resilience and biodiversity that we're going to need, especially in times of climate change, but that the yields can be as high or higher than industrial agriculture. So um, there's a lot of material, and we can talk about that later. If you have questions about that, too, I can direct you to some of those resources. Um, so with that said, ultimately, I think, um, you know, hunger begins at the household level, and food security is addressed at the household level. And here we are talking about our household level, local, and then we grow to, to global for those of us working on some of the global issues. So um, why don't you, like I said, if you maybe take a minute or two to talk more about what you do, and if you'd like to say a few comments about how you view your, your work fitting into this local construct, perhaps, of hunger and food security, and if perhaps you see it making a link as well to global links. Does that make sense? You want to go ahead? <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Bruce Palma, General Manager of Co-Opportunity in Santa Monica. Uh, we're a food cooperative. Uh, we've been in business about 37 years, and for us, we've always had as our mission to focus uh, as much on organics, local, uh, healthy choices, so and we've stuck with that all the way through now, and we source from some of these farmers as well. Um, so our, our the way we see ourselves is that we're really staying true as best as we can as a business to our values, which really are the food choices that we're providing in the store are supporting the, the greater picture that we're talking about here. Um, so we, we use those um, 
the greater picture to, to inform what we're actually bringing in the store. So I, we're proud, you know, all the people that work there and our board um, to do our small part. We're the only cooperative in, in Los Angeles, but there's a number of them throughout the country. Um, so that's how we, we have about 95% of our produce department is organic. At some point, 90% of it is local. Uh, so whatever we can get local, we do. Um, good, good. Hi, I'm Phil McGrath. Uh, my family's been farming in Oxnard since the 1870s. Um, my great-grandfather was a cattle rancher. My grandfather was a dairy farmer. My dad was a row crop farmer. And I'm doing what uh, pretty much, I, I kind of like to think that all these changes that's been happening with the different types of farming organizations represent what we are at right now. Just trying to be as diversified as possible, as um, chemical free. We're certified organic. Um, I, I love. I said this earlier. I love to state that 90 years ago, 90% of the population were farmers, mm -hmm. <laughs> and. If you look at it that way, we're down to less than 3% right now. Um, what I think we need to do is keep the planet agrarian. Um, I know someone quoted this to me. In the year 2007, more people lived in rural communities than, or prior to 2007, there were more rural population than urban. Now there's more people that live in cities and aren't on the farm. So I think that was a big uh, change and something we need to look at. I, I really believe just trying to keep everybody agrarian can make uh, a big difference. And I think this event this weekend is positive proof of that. I'll elaborate more on the farm if you want to hear, but I'll let you go. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Will Daniels. I'm the Senior Vice President of Operations and Organic Integrity with Earthbound Farm. Um, I also uh, chair the board of California Certified Organic Farmers. Um, Earthbound has been around for about 27 years, uh, and today we are uh, the, the nation's largest grower, packer, and shipper of organic produce. We distribute across the country, down into Mexico, up into Canada, and do have some exports going over to Asia. Um, we started uh, on two and a half acres in Carmel Valley, California, uh, 27 years ago. And we still have a farm stand there today. Uh, and, and with that farm stand, uh, we host over 250 school tours a year uh, and educate our, our young ones on the benefits of organic. Uh, you know, uh, release uh, insects into the field, talk about the benefits, beneficial insects and their, their power in, on an organic uh, system. And, uh, and, and that's really our best way to connect. Uh, we are not one, one farm, one, one grower. Uh, we have over 150 growers in our network from five acres to 150 acre farms. Uh, and so uh, we, we like to think of ourselves as celebrating local uh, when it's available uh, and we'll be there when it's not. Um, and, and I think that, that having that uh, relationship is extremely important. Uh, today we are uh, farming on 30, 36,000 crop acres annually, certified organic crop acres. Uh, it's our opinion that every uh, acre that we can certify organic and, and farm that way with integrity uh, that, that it's a good thing. So I'd like to see the, uh, the organic movement continue and, and more and more uh, growers adopt those organic practices. Uh, one last comment I'll make is uh, we are in um, Salinas, which is the uh, salad bowl of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, one thing that we have seen in our time in the 27 years there is that uh, we see more and more conventional growers adopting organic practices. 
um, regardless of whether they're certified organic or not, they see it as a good thing for themselves, for their families, for their workers, and for the economics of the farm. So I think as, as, as we mature, uh, as, or, or regress, I should say, back to the way that farming used to be prior to agrochemicals, uh, I, I think that we're going to find that, that it is economically viable um, as long as we can pay a little bit more for food. One last uh, uh, stat I'll throw out there. I, I don't know if you were listening to Joel Salatin on the radio this morning and NPR, uh, but he threw out there a great stat. Um, uh, today, uh, average Americans spend 18% on health care and 9% on food, and uh, decades ago it was the exact opposite. 18% on food and 9% on health care. Part of that has to do, in my opinion, with, uh, with uh, conventional agriculture. Um, and I would love to see that, that number flip again uh, because uh, the farmers here, they deserve it. Uh, and, and they work very hard to deliver healthy food to, to everybody in their community. And it's extremely important that we celebrate that and continue to leverage that. Job well. Hi, my name is Molly Jean, and I'm from Harry's Berries Farm in Oxnard, and I'm happy to see familiar faces out there. Some of our customers are out here today. So, um, We have uh, sold at the Santa, uh, the Santa Monica Farmers Markets for 25 years, and um, we really appreciate all of your support. Without you, we would not exist, so that needs to be said first and foremost. Um, Phil and I both come from many, many generations of, of farmers. So farming is not only our occupation, it's our family's heritage, our, our family traditions. And in these, in these times, small farmers like us are finding it increasingly difficult um, to, to compete. And so the certified farmers market system has been the salvation of our farm as well as many, many others. Direct marketing cuts out the middleman and um, just gives us that little bit more profit margin to keep our farms alive. So we are trying to secure them for following generations. Um, again, this is this is not uh, th this is an important. It's not just what we do. It's it's who we are. Um, as far as when we were first given this topic, Phil and I both said, "Wow, we got a really deep subject and a very heavy subject. Why couldn't we have just gotten the the happy little march down memory lane, 30 years at the farmers market discussion?" But but it's very it's a very important topic. It needs to be discussed. And and while why I as a farmer and, and not not an academia don't have the answers to maybe what we could do in the world, but I think certainly in our little world here in Southern California, you absolutely can we absolutely can feed everyone seasonally and locally and sustainably it, it's all we're so fortunate to live in a climate friendly area that that affords us that I think that it can serve as a model and it can be it can be applied to to other areas and what's local may not be as quite as close and local but it's whatever's closest to you and all, all of that adds up and it would all help so uh, I hope to get answers as well as, as offer information today. Thank you. Great. I'm wondering if um, you all could maybe address what is some of the, what are, say, one of your biggest first number one and number two challenges to either gr continue to grow organic and maintain that integrity or maintain the integrity in the business end or retail end? Um, well, obviously sourcing, um, you know, depending on weather, if, if a crop is, uh, d didn't have a good crop that year, we, we won't have certain things in stock, um, depending on what's available from the farms. But um, we've been pretty lucky. We've been able to carry a lot of what we, we need to sell to the consumers. So as long as it's available, we have a network of maybe 15 to 20 local farmers that we deal with through distributors mostly. Um, one of the questions that you had brought up on, on the draft question was about Walmart. You know, one of the things that we've noticed just in a small way is that if a larger retailer decides to buy up an entire crop of watermelons, which has happened, uh, we have had no watermelon at, at summertime because it was, all, it was all bought up. And I understand the, the economics of it is, you know, the, the farmer would love to sell an entire crop to one person, one retailer or one business because there's, uh, 
economic um, decisions to be made. So th that's been a little concerning. Sometimes organic corn might be out. There's just no more available. And when it's Labor Day and you're out of organic corn as a retailer, people don't know. Well, it's not because we didn't order it. It was because mm -hmm. it just was not available. And we can't, for us to switch to a commercial corn just defeats our entire purpose just to have corn in there. So uh, that's, you know, the more supply that's available, uh, but we've been very lucky in a lot of ways. We've been able to really carry a full line of produce pretty much year round, um, you know, as local as possible. Local and seasonal. Yeah. Uh, God, that all makes sense. And I'm speaking from the grower perspective. Uh, I was a chemical commercial uh, farmer for about 20 years before I got into organic. And there truly are some uh, difficult uh, problems you have, especially weather. You just don't have all the chemicals that are used for uh, fungus or herb, uh, weeds. Uh, the fertilizers that you can get, the chemical fertilizers are incredible. But I kind of went through my learning curve. <laughs> I think I did. And after 10 years, I've just figured out growing what's in season, uh, staying diversified, um, kind of going with the flow. I think organic farming is more of an art than a science. And uh, yeah, I, I do read my farmer's almanac and get information. Um, it's, there are lots of problems with it, uh, but like Molly said, it does give us a little edge, a little more premium, premium on the product. And like Will was saying, um, I, I'd love to see people realize that America grows the cheapest food in the world. We, we do. We're real proud of growing cheap food. Um, I, I think we need to pay more for good, clean, fair food and eating local and eating organic and eating in season when you're out of corn you're out of corn it's he can probably buy it from mexico or any other place but go with the season <laughs> when it's foggy uh, uh cold summer cold winter uh it definitely affects our yields um, yeah, I would say uh, certainly from a uh, crop production and yield standpoint, it, it, there, there are some, some vegetables that are definitely more challenging to grow organically um, and, and uh, really uh, push up more towards that 50% more uh, cost in, in the growing of those crops um, due to insect pressure, time in the field, those sort of things. On the retail side, though, we see um, a, a huge a continued push for price compression. Um, and and that's, that's only going to lead to bad things. Um, unfortunately, there, there, there is a huge disconnect um, in uh, the retail organizations between the buyers and, and the, the decision makers, whether it be the uh, organic department or the food safety or quality department. They often don't really get a choice as far as who gets chosen. Um, it comes down to lowest price provider. Um, and that's just going to lead to more things like, you know, lead in whatever product is next. Unfortunately, uh, if we continue to push um, our supply side towards lowest price, it, you're going to end up in a bad place. Um, the good thing, the good news that's out there in that, in that story, in my opinion, is that um, during the last few years of, of recession, or whatever other kind of financial term you want to put on our, our state of the nation, um, we did not see a decline in, in sales from the organic consumer in the, in the retail setting, which is a great thing. Um, for me, that says that those people get it, that they are willing to spend uh, their, their extra dollars on, on good, healthy food that's not only healthier for them, but healthier for the planet. Um, I think that that's a real good, uh, a silver lining in, in the story. I actually agree with everything, everything all three of you said. And um, again, Phil talking about production, production issues. Um, our father's generation were really enthusiastic about chemical farming. It was supposed to 
make it so they could finally really make, actually make some money at it. So, um, and then of course the pendulum swung the other way and we're realizing in our generation that that was not the right thing to do and it has you know, caused so many detrimental effects in the long term. So, um, so now farming without those chemicals, you don't have that quick fix. You don't have that thing that's gonna knock out what problem you have right away. It, it, it's going to take longer. You're going to lose more. Um, you're, you know that it, it, it comes as part and parcel of farming without chemical usage independence. So, though we have to accept it, that probably is our biggest hurdle. And um, of course, yields aren't as high. And when people come to my farm and they look at my strawberry plants as compared to the commercial farms that are all around us, our plants are small. Our yields are lower. The costs are higher but they taste way better. So that's, that's the alternative. And, and you folks understand that. Thank you. Yeah. So much as, as, as Will says, people have to be willing to budget more for buying quality foods. And I know it's difficult in economic times as we have, and there's a lot of people like, like um, we were talking about how there's so many people in the poverty level, but um, Things like the WIC program have helped yeah. to bring lower income folks in, the Women, Infant, and Children program from the state that does provide market dollars to lower income families so that they can have, they can have the healthy foods that they perhaps are, isn't in their budget. So um, being affordable is difficult, and um, having enough production is difficult, and keeping what you're producing from the elements and bugs and, and all the things nature throws at us it, are, are the obstacles. Uh, one thing, just hearing them you know, from the retailer side, also I think one of the, the beauties of us as a co-op is, is that we, can, you know, we, we don't have the pressure from corporate office to, to be like a Walmart and, and you know, we, we'll ride the prices. So one week cauliflower could be $2 more than it is the next week because our produce manager is just going with whatever the prices come in at, she's gonna reflect and it kind of confuses consumers because they're like, wait a second, last week it was $2 less. <laughs> well, it's produce. It means that this, right. this one came in and it's higher and we can't afford to sell it at the price we were selling it because we, we are in business, we do have to pay rent. Um, but hearing it from their side, you know, I feel good that we're able to at least, you know, we're not able to exert the amount of pressure that, say, a chain grocery store does, but that's a good thing because it, it, it's tough being a farmer. I mean, I'm not a farmer, but I've read enough about it, <laughs> about the price points. Um, and the other thing is, is that I think people need to change their conception of fruits and vegetables if we're speaking of produce because I think they're always, in America, they're not seen as one of the primary parts of the meal. So why should I pay more for it instead of seeing, well, that really could be a large portion of your meal. You could get a lot of nutrients from it instead of seeing, well, why should I spend so much for an organic apple? It's just an apple. Well, it's, you know, yeah. it's changing people's perceptions on where they, you know, how much it really costs, because it's not that much more to pay an extra dollar a pound for something if it's really going to give you the, the nutrients that you're needing, so. Yeah, several of you mentioned um, the factor of uh, having to compete, essentially, then with a, a cheap food system. Yeah. And I think, um, I mean, I think we all know your answer to this, but as we all know, right now in the U.S., the whole paradigm is geared. The reason why the food is cheap is not necessarily because we have a more efficient system with industrial farming. It's, in fact, exactly the opposite because, as we know, it takes millions of dollars per year to make that system even affordable to the average American, and that's why the food is, quote, cheap, is because we're subsidizing the chemical-intensive farming, farming that takes a lot of water and all of those practices. So. Um, that brings up the farm bill issues and things like that is how do we generate uh, enough of a, say, a political um, maelstrom to get energy to go toward, would we want as a, a society to switch our uh, priorities from subsidizing an industrial system to an organic system because right now vegetables and fruits get no subsidies, for example, and organic essentially gets no subsidies, right? So you're out there competing you know, it always, when we say cheap food, it's only cheap. Actually, it's very 
ineffectual and very inefficient. When you look at the inputs of energy, it takes a lot more energy, gasoline, fuel to do this. The pesticide use, we've just used um, 2,000 pounds or 5 billion pounds we exceeded in 2,000 of pesticides and such. So all of this is being subsidized. So is there some, I mean, as I said, I think your answer is just going to be yes, but is there anything in particular as far as a national food policy or farm bill policy that would strengthen your concerns and your challenges that you can share something specific? I, I know for a fact that the farm bill has been in, um, I've been involved with it since 2002, 2002, 2007, and it's coming up again in 2012. This is one of those really boring subjects, <laughs> but um, it is what sets policy uh, for uh, U.S. food. And there are some conservation and some uh, organic funding through right. the Farm Bill for us. We get... Um, small deductions uh, for being certified uh, for the registration process. Um, I can only hope that everyone in this room actually looks at the Farm Bill. Everybody thinks that most of the money goes to farmers' uh, subsidies. I think it's actually 75% of the... The total amount goes total to amount something goes like total amount goes to nutrition and food stamps. Of the, so, oh, of the farm bill. Oh, I thought, and, bill, yeah. and of the subsidies too. But then most after of that, them go the to the larger farms. Is, yeah. uh, subsidies, and I know that's really coming under fire. Mm -hmm. And I hope that with political and public pressure, that we start seeing more funding going to sustainable farming, organic farming, conservation practices, and. Uh, Again, it's farm bill, real boring stuff, but real important stuff. Yeah, organic or food in the in the uh, marketplace, organic food in the marketplace today, I think is 4% penetration. Uh, organic produce is 9%. Um, so I, <clears throat> I don't know if, if we have 9% of the funding from mm -hmm. the farm bill. I would seriously doubt it. Yeah. I think it's probably less than 1%. It is, yeah. Um, and and that's, that's a real problem. Uh, the challenge is is that the uh, folks that that make that that uh, needle move are uh, influenced in two ways: one by their constituents, uh, which is you, and one is by the lobbyists. And um, it's been my experience that that uh, the chemical lobbyists out there are are some of the biggest and the baddest, and they get what they want. Um, so the only way that we're going to change that is by uh, you speaking to your representative and making sure that your voice is heard. Um, I really think that that's the way this is going to change. Um, I don't think it's necessarily going to come from the top down. It's going to come from the bottom up. Um, this the organic movement is an interesting one in that most food trends uh, start in the restaurant and go to retail. Uh, this one's going the opposite way. Um, so it's a little bit different, but I, uh, and I don't know where that connection is, but, uh, but nonetheless, I think it's important that, um, you know, uh, the organic consumer speak up and, and tell uh, their representatives what they believe is important, because that's really what's going to change uh, what's happening uh, up on the hill. That's absolutely true. It really is going to take a gra grassroots effort to, to, uh, to, to continue with what's starting. It's encouraging on the one hand because some progress is being made, but it's so slow. <laughs> and it's such an uphill battle. And um, again, it's because uh, you know a, a very few are making the decisions for many. And in that instance, the few always win out and benefit, and the many do not benefit and suffer. So uh, we, I, I hope again with these gentlemen that uh, that it, the progress will move quicker, and so you know write your legislators, be vocal, let let people know that that you you want great healthy food not only for yourselves but for your communities, and uh, it's it's just building a healthier future for all of us. Great. Keep voting with your dollar. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and. 
Yeah, as, as you mentioned, Farm Bill is kind of boring stuff and policy, but this is essentially, if unless we address it really as a nation and as a populace, you know, it's great that organic is growing, but at a certain point, and I think you've all talked about this, it's really hard and you're going to, and you hit a wall eventually, whether it be in the farming itself mechanism or through the distribution channels of trying to get your product out there. It's the more industrialized our system is and the more we subsidize that. It's, you know, we, we can't, it's going to remain a niche. Yeah. And the criticism that people always say is, well, organic's all fine and good, but it's an elitist thing. The, the problem is, I would, you know, I think we have to counter with the opposite. The elite are getting hundreds of millions of dollars to farm with chemicals and to use up our natural resources. And, and we really need to take that on, um, all of us, I think, together. Um, I'll do one more. I think we're going to do questions from the audience. But one thing I wanted to bring up, a few of you talked about climate. We talked backstage a bit about water issues. And um, I think, as we all know, one of the big arguments being put forth for industrial agriculture, actually within, say, climate fora, both in the US and on internationally, is to say that we need industrial seeds and crops, and including genetically modified crops, to feed the world because they will respond better to climate change. Um, and what the argument is is that they'll have drought resistant, salt resistant, you know, salt tolerant and all these things. And as we know, there's no genetically modified seed at all right now that has that trait, but somehow everyone thinks it does. Um, we know that genetically modified seeds don't outperform in yield um, uh, and all of those things. So it's really a false solution. But nevertheless, climate change or global warming is coming. Um, we, you know, Russia just had their drought a few years ago. It severely impacted their wheat. Um, that affected global uh, rise in food prices. It resulted in a huge food crisis scare. That was one element. And uh, many people actually did go hungry because of that spike in prices of wheat. Um, we're seeing in the Midwest uh, water tables dropping. Now that's a combination probably of using too much water, but also it's linked to not getting enough rain now to replenish the aquifers, and we're seeing some shifts in weather even here in the U.S. So my question is to the farmers, have you yet seen, I mean, I think California is still the golden state somewhat of <laughs> agriculture, but are you seeing any indications yet or have talked to other farmers of anything that's... Oh, I, I love to comment to this. Um, <laughs> we live in a desert. Yes. <laughs> Nobody ever thinks about that. This is Southern California, and it's a desert. And yeah, in the Oxford Plains, we're having incredible water problems there. Uh, I think it was in the early 80s, the state of California came to Ventura County and said, uh, we're either going to sue you for $10 million or give you $10 million to put a water program together. So we put a water program together where we started diverting water from the Santa Clara River to put into sand ponds to hold back seawater intrusion. It worked great for about 20 years. Now their monitoring is showing that we've got the same problem again because we're pumping so much water out of our aquifers. If we get wet years forever, we'll be fine. But again, we live in the desert, and we don't get wet years. Our average rainfall is 14 inches a year, but typically we'll get five or six inches this year and 20 or 30 inches this year. It comes all at once and goes out in the ocean. They divert what they can. Um, I really believe this is the biggest problem we're all going to have. It's going to affect what we grow, what we eat, population, uh, everything. And um, yeah, we're seeing it. I, we have two wells on our ranch. One of them is completely salted up, and the other one doesn't pump as much as it used to. Mm -hmm. Most of our water comes from a water agency called United Water, and um, what their rates increased? 40. Their rate their increase is going to 46 point something percent next year. So yeah. I mean, that's a huge hike. Yeah. Huge. Ah, uh, and actually, there's municipalities that are challenging it and taking us to court, um, which is a whole other subject. Um, 
Molly, maybe you can elaborate more. I know water's an issue. Water, water is an issue not only where we farm, but er everywhere in the state. It's, it's, you know, Phil has this, has this banner on his, on the oh. fence, where, f where water flows, food grows. And that's kind of it in a nutshell. If we don't have water, we don't have food. So we have to do more, more to conserve you know, better, better water usage. I mean, in our area, I think that it, we've got some pretty fair conservation yes, plans do. in place. Everybody, nearly everyone uses drip irrigation, which yes. conserves roughly, roughly 40 some percent okay. of the water usage. It's, it's substantial. Uh, very few people are doing the old furrow irrigation because it's so wasteful and, and you're not just watering your root zone, you're watering your rows and your sides <laughs> of your beds and creating weeds and more problems. So I think that we've adopted uh, more modern watering techniques that are great for conservation. Um, they're also moderating, moder monitoring the quality more than ever. We are actually adjacent to the uh, spreading ponds for, uh, for the aquifer, so we've got our, our city's drinking water below us. We're right on that Santa Clara River where that water is diverted from. And um, they monitor it really closely for, for uh, pesticide drain off, you know, anything that could contaminate that water source. So measures are being made, but it's getting increasingly scarce. We're not getting the rains that we used to get on a regular winter basis. It's not getting replenished, and our population is growing. So that's another topic. That is another, that is another topic. <laughs> that uh, someday we're not going to have enough water to, to, to feed everyone. So um, even on your lawns, please conserve. Do your part. Well, and just to add to the well, to show what champions even more that, that you all are. I mean, industrial agriculture consumes 70% of all global freshwater resources. So by doing those conservation methods or organic farming that takes less water, that's, you're tremendously helping the whole hydrological cycle related to global warming. And also, um, the, we've been writing about this for years, many um, of us working on this issue, but 30% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions now the World Bank just acknowledged actually are related to industrial agriculture and that's things like using nitrogen fertilizers in the soil which is 60 percent of our total global nitrous oxide emissions that's more potent than CO3 by 200 percent I think 296 percent so um, again just to, to show when we're talking about climate change and how can we really mitigate that or respond to that and adapt to that organic is the only way that provides the resilience and biodiversity and preserving soils and water and stuff that we can go not only here in the US but around the world and a lot of the studies I was talking about where the yields did increase with organic were precisely because they had such a terrible shift in their soils and, and denuded and things, and the organic built it up to also increase the yields for um, regions in Africa and places that are going to be really hard hit by global warming. So, um, so we can take the bite out of climate change, too, just by eating, I mean, really eating local organic. People feel, I think, a lot of times, like, what can I possibly do? Greenhouse gases, it's a huge issue. I can't really affect anything. That's for policymakers. Right here, right now, local. You, what you're buying and what you're consuming has a rippling effect uh, around the world and is really addressing our food insecure world and you're helping to make it more food secure. And I know you have something to add to yeah, that. Yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, in my opinion, the, uh, the global warming uh, crisis is really a, uh, uh, an issue of unbalanced ecosystems. Um, and, and organic is, is just the opposite of that. And, and so I believe that if we could potentially, you know, increase the amount of organic farming that's happening around the world, that maybe we can turn the pendulum the other direction. In our 36,000 annual crop acres, we're saving, uh, uh, avoiding the use of 11.5 million pounds of conventional ag chemicals on farm. Mm -hmm. We are that keeping 1.8 million gallons of petroleum off of the farm, and we are uh, sequestering enough CO2 on farm uh, to take 7,800 cars off the road every year. 
if, if more farms could, could do that, it, it is going to make a difference. And we got to keep, keep uh, beating the drum and keep getting, getting people to, to try organic and, and convert. I mean, that's the real big key here. We can't do it. This little tiny community is not going to do it. We need to get our friends to be doing it as well and keep the movement alive. I don't have the exact statistic, and I'm not here to get on a soapbox, but I think if we're talking about global warming and water usage and resource usage, you know, the, the planet's just going to have to shift to more of a plant-based diet because it can't support the, the amount of resources that it takes to grow a pound of beef as opposed to a pound of vegetables, you know, I don't know if it's five to ten times more water, whatever it is. Um, and as population grows, and certainly area, like other countries are, if we're trying to push our way of eating onto other countries, it's really a meat-based diet, which means it's just going to take so much more grain and so much more water just to, you know, to, to feed China. You know, their meat consumption was so small compared to what I think people in the mm -hmm. agribusiness and business want it to be, and that, again, that just sucks up all the, the resources which are already you know, becoming yeah, more Yeah, and you hear this everywhere that we're going to need because of increasing population and climate change that we're going to have to, and that people are adopting as people become more affluent, we're going to have to respond to that by something like doubling the amount of land that we need to put under agriculture cultivation. And that's, again, why they say, well, we'll have instead GMO seeds, which will have higher yields, which they don't. But uh, to your point of that, they're basing that, that we have to double our yields and double the acreage based on the assumption that everyone will assume the meat-eating diet that we have here in the West. And I think as you're suggesting we, uh, there needs to be a planetary shift. You know, we have less to, sh to for, so other people can have more or uh, some kind of equilibrium there. So um, I think we want to take those some questions from the audience, if you all have questions. Um, just about while you're getting a question ready, the carbon sequestration, there's sure. a study Before by... Ro we, oh, sorry. There's a Before study we go by... Before questions, I just <laughs> want to say two things. Um, one is that on Thursday on the Farm Bill, they discussed this at yesterday's policy summit, there's going to be a rally Thursday at City Hall to mobilize for the Farm Bill through Food and Water Watch and Hunger Action. Also, our next panel talking about the impact of uh, global warming is going to be on 21st century meat and dairy, which we know has a huge impact on the environment and the amount of stuff that happens with meat. So that's at 4 o'clock, and I'll be ready to bring this mic to anybody who has questions. Um, hands are going up. <laughs> yeah. I had a, um, uh, three questions. I'll try and state them as briefly as possible. Uh, how has the government definition of organic made your life easier or more difficult? Um, the uh, cross-pollination and the patent infringement uh, litigation by Monsanto monopolizing the world food supply, has there, are you aware of any legal challenges to this effort? And um, would you speak to the resiliency of the soil vis-a-vis -vis the concerns of the author who wrote the book Vegetarian Myth uh, about monocropping and how organic assist with that or how you see that definition of organic maybe having to modify as we face these uh, climate challenges. Did you understand that last question? I think I I, the, the last, one. yeah, I'm not sure about the first two, but I'm going to start with the last one. Being organic, growing organic, forces you to be diversified, which is a wonderful uh, thing. Your, your soil it's very hard to be a monocropper and be organic. It, it just is. Most of my organic farmer friends tell me if you're going to grow strawberries on a piece of ground, you really shouldn't come back to that ground for another seven years. Now, I can't do that because I'm, I come back after about four years mm -hmm. when I, but that's the, the wonderful thing about being an organic farmer. You get to grow a bunch of different things. My biggest problems aren't insects. My biggest problems are rabbits and squirrels. <laughs> they just, it's a salad bowl out there. <laughs> but um, I, I wanted to call, you said something about government helping or hurting the... The organic standards. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's three years of no chemicals whatsoever. And then during that time, I think you're allowed to call it transitional organic. But uh, three years, and then uh, you've got to have a certifier come to your farm. <laughs> and we were checked for water analysis, leaf analysis, and soil analysis. And uh, you're with CCOF. Mm -hmm. We're with a smaller certifier in Ojai called Organic Certifiers. And it's, they come out at least twice a year. One is unannounced. The other one is a uh, setup date. Um, it, it's a process. Uh, we were adding up how many licenses we needed just to grow food and sell in the direct marketing system. I think I have seven licenses. And to me, that's absurd. I, I'm just, you know, Department of Weights and Measures, uh, the state, uh, the feds. Uh, it, I think government regulation is... Is yes, I, we, you, we spend a lot of time doing paperwork instead yeah. of farming, so I think that's what, what Phil's, Phil's talking about. And, you know, your original answer, yes, um, row, crop rotation is probably the most important thing you do as a chemical-free farmer. And the other thing that my husband swears is, is an absolute must is he cover crops. You can't just keep taking, taking, taking yeah. from your soil. You have to feed it. So many times, large portions of our, of, our, of our fields are planted in things that we're never gonna bring to market and sell, but it's a price we have to pay, it's something we have to do in order to nourish our soul. Otherwise, we end up with a dust bowl and, yeah. and we can't let that happen. So um, it's, it's, it's a lengthy process, it's a time-consuming process, it's a lot involved in juggling around especially when you have small acreage like we do in in juggling your crop rotations and making it possible but it's necessary yeah crop rotation is the key uh, feeding I, I'll just repeat what these guys said because uh, you know organic farming farming feeds the soil not the plant and that's that's the key um, and monocropping in organic setting is I think a really bad business adventure adventure because you are going to be uh, hit with every kind of challenge you could possibly think of um, and eventually not really have a crop to sell because you're going to be uh, losing yield year after year in my opinion. Um, I think where you were going with the government thing was more about the national organic program versus uh, you know uh, regional certification or no certification at all. I think that's an interesting thing. You know, you, you hear very loud and clear, uh, less paperwork, no government regulations would be better. Um, but, but the flip side of that is that um, the National Organic Program legitimized uh, organic uh, in, in, the, in the general public's eyes anyways. And, and I find it funny, I, 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 CCOF is, is uh, California Certified Organic Farmers is, is made up mostly of small growers. Um, you know, uh, 2,500 strong, um, and and it's 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 from farmers like that who were passionate about organic farming, uh, and and the folks around me here who brought organic to that national level. Um, but once it got there, they were like, "Ooh, I don't really want that to happen. I just wanted everybody to pay attention to all the good stuff that we were doing." So it's it's kind of a double-edged sword. It brings. Uh, a definition, a, a level playing field, if you will, to organic growers uh, across the nation. But on the other side of the, the coin, it, it, it's, it's um, more regulation, more paperwork, more to deal with. Um, so it's a, it's a balance. And legal challenges you asked about. Um, the Center for Food Safety, where I work, we've actually done numerous challenges against uh, well, in particular, it's usually the parties are, they start off to be the USDA for approving uh, genetically modified alfalfa, genetically modified sugar beets um, as two examples, and then Monsanto is, enters into the suit as well with the USDA as they're an interested party. So part of that is challenging a bit of the kind of patenting aspect, but the angle that we usually go for is that they approve these things without doing the proper environmental assessment statement. Um, 
Also, unfortunately, I would have to say the Obama administration has proved to be, we were winning these cases um, quite a lot, and as you guys probably recently know, the uh, USDA just approved um, genetically modified alfalfa. Um, the courts now are also kind of overturning other decisions, and it looks like, and the GM sugar beets uh, challenge looks like right now it's precarious. Um, the, this administration also advanced um, GE salmon, or tried to get that commercialized, and we're watchdogging that. Um, and unfortunately, this administration is very um, pro-GM, if you want to put it that way, and is bringing up a lot of, uh, you know, Monsanto friendly, if you will, or biotech company friendly, we're finding that a huge challenge right now. You know, just a, a quick personal story. I have a sister who's lived on Molokai in Hawaii for decades, and um, <clears throat> I was just visiting her this summer, and uh, um, Molokai is, is a very small island and doesn't have a very good economy. Tourism was there for a while. It's kind of left, and so agriculture has really been it. Um, I, I come to learn that Monsanto has basically bought the island um, and is um, a hero to the locals on, on Molokai because there's an income for those residences, but residents, but they don't understand that, uh, that they are probably not only uh, doing damage to the, the local environment, but uh, what they are outside of uh, Molokai, and, and it's a real shame. Uh, Molokai, or excuse me, uh, Monsanto is a, is a behemoth and one that is very um, shrewd in the way that they do business. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a representative in the audience today, quite frankly. That's how they, that's how they work, and, and it's really a huge shame. And again, we just need to talk more about it. Um, as you speak of these corporations, and you earlier you referenced the farm bill and how unfortunately the pressures coming, the lobbyist pressures coming from these corporations, the chemical corporations funding the lobbyists. And I'm curious um, as to how the organic corporations are going to be involved in this and what kind of pressure organic corporate America plans to also put pressure on the government similar to what Monsanto's doing. That's you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was specific. That's OK. They, I, I think that, that uh, there, there needs to be uh, that, uh, you know, if, if, if we're not at the, at the table, then we're missing out on the opportunity to be at the table and comment. And, and so um, there's uh, the Organic Trade Association that is um, it, it's funded primarily of corporate organic uh, companies. Um, and they do a lot of work to, uh, to uh, lobby um, for organic, um, both large and small. In fact, um, CCUF just partnered with them to uh, bring the voice of the small grower to the hill, too. Um, so it's extremely exciting to see that kind of lobbying effort. Um, annually, they do a, uh, a hill day where they go uh, and bring, uh, you know, constituents to Washington and, and talk about uh, the benefits of organic and what we're doing to the local communities, uh, all the, the benefits that we're bringing not only to the environment but also to uh, the folks within that environment. So I think OTA is probably the, 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 the best channel today, I would say, for, for, for lobbying, but Debbie might have some more uh, since that's her her hometown today. I like how you kept it on a more positive bend. I could just go down the negative path of all of the counter lobbies of Monsanto. I mean, they've spent, I think, I just did a report. Um, I'm doing this report with Dr. Vanda Nashiva, a global report on GMOs. In the next two weeks, it'll probably be on our website, centerforfoodsafety.org, and it will cover a lot of this, um, a, a lot of these issues. But I can't remember the figure exactly, but Monsanto and the top biotech industry, I mean, they did something I think it's since 1999, 50 million in uh, lobbying. They have about 100 lobbyists that are identifiable. That's not counting PACs and other kind of groups. Um, there's this phenomenon in Washington called the revolving door where you have, you know, the former 
uh, marketing lobbyist for Monsanto is now, uh, you know, one of the senior advisors in the USDA or uh, positions like that. So, all the, as we say, the regulated are becoming now the regulators, um, and vice versa. We have a lot of former congressmen, uh, congressional staff, White House staff now working as lobbyists for Monsanto and other corporations. So, it's rather uh, really particularly challenging now. And as I think I referenced before, it's discouraging that the Obama administration, in fact, seems to be so much more aggressive in wanting to approve and go along with a kind of an industrial paradigm, whether that be approving genetically modified seeds and crops to extending trade agreements, which is a whole other issue, but has really led to this import-export model where instead of populations around the world growing locally, local food for primarily local uh, populations now have been switched to import-export, and you have developing countries that were self-sufficient in food uh, prior to big uh, trade agreements, especially the World Trade Organization, that are now the countries that are um, having these huge rising uh, hunger indices. So um, in every way, we're having challenges from all kind of sides addressing this. Uh, six months ago, approximately, I read in the business section of the LA Times that 90% of our sugar crop in the United States of America has been planted with Monsanto seeds. How did this happen? What can we do about it? And is the primary focus really, before everything else, the very boring farm bill? The very boring what? I didn't catch. Farm bill. Oh. Well, as far as the sugar, I think they're probably referring to genetically engineered sugar beets, because sugar beets make up, and also corn, which is made into fructose. And I think 90% of our corn now is genetically modified. About 80 or 90% of our sugar beets now are genetically modified. I think that's what that was referring to. Um, Let's get back to eating whole foods. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, sugar. If we can get, a, get around the high fructose corn oh, sugar yeah. deal, that would be a really good thing for yeah. a lot of people. Yeah, and demand to be labeled. There are other, you know, labeling campaigns, again, this is an uphill battle, I know, but as our slogan, it used to be for one campaign we had untested, uh, unlabeled, and you're eating it, you know? And if people knew more, then they might have an effect on some of the policy or the policy might change. I think we just change. need to show less of a demand. Sugar, salt, and trans fats, that's pretty much what's ruining children yeah. in our schools today. Yeah. So, yeah. I, There's a question down here. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I would like to give my thanks to all of you for staying so true to your mission in spite of all the challenges. Um, and I'm curious about, I'm going to bring it back to a little bit about the local solutions we're coming up with. I'm curious about how all the different sort of avenues that you all have taken have affected one another. So in other words, Bruce, um, how has the rise of farmers markets changed your business, changed what you do? Um, Molly and Phil, how has um, the rise of um, organic production to the scale of Earthbound affected what you do? It, you know, not necessarily bad, good, but how has it changed how you look at your models? Um, well, you know, I, I think it's just a, a double-edged, uh, two sides of a coin. Um, one is, is that obviously there's, you know, there is competition. If, if people from our shoppers on a Saturday don't want to go to our store, they can go right down to three different farmers markets, let's say. Um, so, you know, number one, it forces us to just make sure that we keep being the best we can be. Um, on the other hand, I think it just exposes more people, and I think that's what people miss. You know, we've got how many Whole Foods around us? It, our store, there's six within five miles, and we grow, you know. Um, and so I think it's just it just exposes more people, which is what you were talking about we want. So people who go to a farmer's market just get, a, you know, exposed to organic fruits and vegetables, and it just really just eventually 
they'll come through our store at one point, a certain percentage of those people. Um, and so I think it all, it, it all works in one way and we just try not to have a scarcity mentality of you know, us against them with, any, with anybody. Um, you know, there's enough to go around, like you said, especially here in California, so. I'll go next. You go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Millie. Um, well, I think that as it's a circle. As demand grows, supplies grow. So as more people become aware and conscious of their eating habits and desire and seek out sustainable foods, then more sustainable foods will be grown. Um, if, as more people are willing to spend a few pennies more for that better product, then sustainable food will increase. So it really, again, I'm sorry to put all the onus on you folks, but again, it comes down to you. On the local level, if you guys are farmer's market shoppers, you all have your favorites, you all know how fantastic it is. But when you get a new neighbor, make a farmer's market basket. Put them on our farmer's market schedule in there. Introduce them to something fabulous. They'll love you forever, you'll be great neighbors. You go to a, a, a party, instead of taking a bottle of wine, take something fabulous from the farmer's market as a hostess gift. You need to spread the word. You know, it's like the more people that support us, the more farmers, are going to be helped by it, and those of us that are there are going to be able to continue farming. It's really all up to you. Our fate is in your hands. So what you want, we will supply, and, um, and I, I think that's, that's really, you know, we're counting on you, so please help. And kind of elaborating on that, I think that what Will has, Earthbound Farms, is, it, it is big, it, it's really, it's giant, but, <laughs> It's nice that there's still a demand for the small farmer. I, it, there's plenty there's of room. room. There's room yeah. for both, and there's a need for both. We can't feed everybody that Will's feeding, so we're yeah. glad Will is, is there to provide many, many more people that didn't have access. Not everybody lives in the perfect climate like we do and yeah. has everything. There's places that are cold lots of the times of the year, and they're not going to be able to eat the way we do. People, people like, like Earthbound, and companies like Earthbound are, are going to be critical to provide more to more people, more organic product yeah. to more people. You know, I, I see it as the farmer's market kind of leveraging our, our products and our brands because people go to the farmer's market, they get a wonderful experience because everything they buy there is fresh and delicious and tastes great. And then they say, hmm, I'd like a tomato today, but there isn't a farmer's market I can get one from. Let me go to the retail community and get one. And uh, you, mm -hmm. you, your choice is between a conventional red thing uh, <laughs> or an organic tomato. And, and hopefully they go, wow, I remember that experience I had with, with that tomato I got from the farmer's market. I'm going to the organic tomato. So that's... I, I think that these guys are right, and, and it's great to be on a panel where it's not, you know, big versus small. Because yeah, I don't, I all. think that's the wrong approach. I think that uh, we, like they said, we can all get along together. There's plenty out there. There's still what, uh, you know, 81 per, or 91 percent of the uh, retail is still conventional. So there's still a lot of opportunity there. And as long as we can leverage off each other, I think that's where where it's going to be uh, exciting. I don't want to elaborate too much, but I think the bigger picture here is farmers in America or California or in our region competing with farmers in Argentina or uh, Spain or places where I know in Mexico the workers get paid $5 a day down there. That's not a level playing field. I have a much bigger issue with produce from Mexico and South America where they do not have the same sustainable outlook that I think more California farmers try and do. We are trying to pay our workers more. We are trying to use less chemicals. Um, we're still trying to make a business too. And I, I, that to me is a much bigger issue, Amelia, that I contend with. Uh, not so much earthbound, more uh, out of country competition that uh, organics from China. <laughs> Chinese gold. Yeah, and people, people have to quit wanting things when they're not in season and quit wanting things that they have to get from the, the opposite hemisphere 
Yeah. So it, you know, it, you have to change your eating pat patterns yeah. and and uh, and recognize. I mean, you know, we, when we run out of strawberries and people are mad at me over it and they yell at us at the table because we don't have any, I usually invoke. I, I have to uh, bite my tongue and not invoke my father's saying, which was. I don't have any blankety blank strawberry making machine. <laughs> and you have to imagine that with a really heavy Japanese accent and a lot of expletives peppered in. So anyway, I have to bite my tongue. But that is the fact. We don't have, this is not a machine. It's called the agricultural arts. It's as much art as it is science. And, um, you know, we can't have everything all the time. And you have to not have the taste for everything all the time. I just want to add just one thing. I know there's more questions, but you drive up and down the five and you see all these garlic trucks, you know, and you just told the guy. And I was in one store, I won't say where it was, and it, and it was garlic from China, and I think that just did it for me. I said, <laughs> how could I even... Driving through Gilroy? Where did Gilroy? this come from? I mean, <laughs> garlic is in the backyard. Anyway. Thank you so much for what we've been talking about so far. I'd like to shift the focus a little bit. Um, you, you mentioned earlier in the talk about the cost of this real, you know, the cheap food, that there's many more costs involved with this that don't get put into that dollar sign or those cent signs that we see in the marketplace. Has anybody done that research to come up with an estimate of the true cost of our food that is conventionally grown? There's actually a lot of research oh, yeah. on it. I don't have that, but there's a lot of, um, you could, I direct you to Cornell University, David Pimentel um, has done a lot of research on the energy inputs, for example, of conventional versus industrial, as well as water inputs and subsidy costs. Do you know of other, there are lots of resources, do you all know of resources to recommend, but? Um, yeah, the, there's many studies done on true cost of foods. I just read, I think I'm on same, page here in my Farm Bureau magazine last week that uh, it is cheaper for Imperial Valley growers to ship their product to China than to truck it to the San Joaquin. So when you talk about true cost of foods and you're shipping something 15,000 miles away and it's cheaper, there is something very wrong here. They're not taking into account all the pollution, all the Time. It's just usage, so crazy. And the subsidies to that, too. Okay. It's really, when we say yes. cheaper, I always like to say highly subsidized oh, yeah. food. It's not really uh, cheap. It's not really right? that price. It's just that the taxpayer money is paying it. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It's buried costs. Do we have, I think we need to wrap up. Um, one last question. A question right down here, here and here, and, <laughs> and we'll have to have short answers. Uh, in trying to have us take ownership of what you grow and supporting you and the financial cost and awareness factor. Can you speak to how CSAs enable that process and maybe how we can get more people involved with CSAs? Um, that, that's definitely another piece of the puzzle. That's definitely another great outlet for s small to mid-sized family farmers. And I think that they are still on the rise. They've been around for many, many years, but um, I think that it, it's definitely a very, very positive direction to take, and I hope more farms do it. it but it wouldn't be all, you know, it, a lot of people are doing it in conjunction with their farmer's market sales. It's another outlet, and farmers have to be creative in what outlets we, we take, uh, because we don't have the conventional uh, wholesale marketing uh, system, you know, the regular roads. So we look for different paths. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, people are visual, absolutely. You physically look at that box, yes. And it's very rewarding because you, you helped cause that box to come into creation. For anyone who doesn't know what a CSA is, it's you know, community-supported uh, agriculture, and you buy a share, it, uh, and the, the farmer uses that money to to produce those crops, and when the crops become ready, you get regular weekly um, deliveries of that, your portion of that crop. And I think it's a wonderful, uh, I don't do it myself, but I think it's an absolutely wonderful thing. You know, one of the, I think one of the benefits of, of CSA uh, style of purchasing is that it kind of pushes you uh, to things that you probably wouldn't have purchased at the farmer's market. 
Um, so from a, a culinary experience, I think it broadens your horizon and, and really brings things to you that you wouldn't have chosen if it was up to you at the farmer's market. So it's, I like it because it, 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 it can be perceived as kind of the gateway into organic and, and, and what's out there, or, or it's better for the kind of more the, the hardcore organic consumer because they don't have to go and do all that shopping. They get, they get it brought to them or they go pick it up all in one basket kind of a deal. But I like the diversity factor. So we have one more question, and then I think. I'll make this very short. I'd love to talk to you guys about this issue afterwards. But one of you mentioned that you are required to have seven licenses and you didn't list for what agencies. But again, a definition of a license is that you are getting permission to do something that if you didn't have the license, would be illegal for you to do. <laughs> and if I understand you guys are producing food and feeding people, and somehow that's becoming illegal in this country. So a very simple question. Uh, these, seven licenses, these seven licenses that you were required, uh, is the food that you're producing safer, healthier, and a lower cost to the public? Sorry, the question? Is the, having these seven licenses, can you, can you demonstrate that because you have these seven licenses, the food that you're producing is now safer, healthier, and a lower cost to the public? Because of these seven licenses? <laughs> the answer might be no. I, I, I was just, to me, being involved in the direct marketing system, which was created by Jerry Brown in the 70s, uh, it, it's one of the most basic economic things you can do, and I'm just stunned that I have to have more and more oversight and regulation. I mean, I, I know that food safety and sanitation is a big issue. I, I completely understand that point. It's just trying to grow food on my farm and having a direct, uh, the consumer coming and eating it. We, we've never had any issues. I, and I, not say it's going to always be that way. I hope it is, but uh, uh, I, I can't exactly know where I want to go next. I just, you know, the whole organic licensing program is great, but I know a lot of people that are not certified and all your yeah, and, and, and I and I do want to state that clearly and unequivoc unequivocally, we have grown, we have farmed for the last. 13 of our 45 years you, with no chemical usage and only using uh, National Organic Program materials and practices. However, we do not certify. Yeah. And it's not because I have some terrible uh, thing against certification. Actually, I, I really commend, in particular, CCOF because their standards are actually more stringent than yeah. the national program, and I completely support what they do. But in our instance, we've been building a business, and you have to pay a certain percentage of your gross sales. And because in our instance, we sold virtually everything that we grew, we, our, our supply, our, our demand exceeded our, exceeds our supply. I don't really, we have not made the decision to give that money <laughs> to somebody else. <laughs> but we have a personal relationship with our consumer, with our customers. We see them across the table from us week after week. They ask us what we do. We tell them they believe us. Yeah. That, that's how, how, how we are. But I totally understand the need for such regulation because Phil's honest, I'm honest about what we do, but maybe not everybody is or would be. Right. So, so I, I don't disagree with certification. We just not have done, we have not done it for ourselves for the the, right. uh, the the reasons I mentioned. All right, we have one very last question, and then we're going to wrap. Yeah, uh, back to the topic of the talk: Can local and organic feed the world? Um, <clears throat> my question is: What kind of infrastructure would need to be in place in order to support that? Because right now you're just small or smaller businesses relative to the big ag companies. So what kind of infrastructures would be needed to that, for that to become a reality? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And I'm, I'm going to talk to the concept of food hubs, uh, which isn't uh, like the downtown LA produce market, mm -hmm. which is pretty <laughs> typical all over the world. In all major metropolitans, there are these giant produce markets. The food hub, which 
I think familyfarm.org has sponsored mm -hmm. us some of them, is kind of a uh, network of satellites where farmers would bring in a, their product and this hub could either distribute it to local institutions or have a retail such as a co-opportunity business and also process uh, food. And then they would also network with each other. It's a smaller scaled down version of uh, big global uh, Cisco's. <laughs> Just something that's, uh, I know a number of people are working on this. Roots of Change has supported this with uh, some people that are really trying to promote this concept. And uh, I'm on the Los Angeles uh, Food Policy Council and right now we're working on starting Food Hub in Los Angeles and a series of them throughout Southern California. That's one example. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anyone at this table yet has answered the question, and I do want to answer the question. <laughs> yes, local organic can feed the world. So. <laughs> Great panel. Let's give our, our panelists a, a hand. Thank you so much. And all these uh, sessions are being videotaped, so we're going to put them up online when they're able to be streamed. So you can check it out on goodfoodfestivals.com. Thank you all. Thank you.